Uh, the Living Memorial to Woodrow Wilson. Uh, we are a nonpartisan non-advocacy institute that brings together the worlds of scholarship and policy uh, for dialogue. Specifically, the Environmental Change and Security Project that's hosting uh, the session today is a 11-year-old uh, project that tries to bring the worlds of uh, environment, science, development, health, population together with issues of foreign policy, development policy, and even security policy. Uh, so we are thrilled today to be able to host uh, the Washington launch of One Planet, Many People, Atlas of Our Changing Environment, a new publication uh, from the United Nations Environment Program. Uh, as you can see, um, a publication this big has a lot of contributors, a lot of people that come to the table to, uh, to work hard on, on such a product. And so we're thrilled that we have um, many of those people here today. And I will uh, introduce them all very briefly uh, before um, getting the program underway. I should say we are, we are thrilled um, to have a, a, a number of co-sponsors for today's meeting. United Nations Environment Program, NASA, the US Geological Survey, University of Maryland, the Wilson Center, of course, and the International Human Dimensions Program on Global Environmental Change. Uh, we're very sorry that a couple of our colleagues that we'd hoped could be with us uh, have been pulled away at the last minute. Brennan Van Dyke uh, from the UNEP's regional office here in North America and uh, John Turner from the State Department. But fortunately, we have two of John's colleagues um, to join us, and so we will still uh, benefit from the remarks from the State Department. And so let me introduce our, our illustrious panel very quickly so that we can get to the discussion of the new book. Uh, Fernando Echeverria is in the Oceans, Environmental, uh, Oceans International Environment and Scientific Affairs Office at the State Department, Office of Space and Advanced Technology, who will uh, make some opening remarks, uh, ones that I think if John Turner were here would, would be making similar remarks. Uh, John, and then uh, as we go through the session, John Matuzak, also from OES, Office of Environmental Policy, will, will chair the session and, and guide us through today's discussion. Steve Lonergan, who is the Director of Division of Early Warning and Assessment at UNEP out of Nairobi, uh, and a longtime collaborator, I should say, with the Woodrow Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Project. So we're thrilled that Steve is in town. Steve will make some uh, remarks about the kind of origins of the book and, and how uh, he uses it and how he hopes others will use it. Uh, Ashbindu Singh, who's the regional coordinator for UNEP's Division of Early Warning and Assessment, based here in Washington, uh, will, uh, in, in some respects, present uh, a number of the images from the report and present the, the, the book. And so we're thrilled that Ashbindu, who, uh, being here in Washington, we work with quite a lot as well, so we're thrilled that Ashbindu can do that. Uh, John Townsend, who is a professor and chairman, Department of Geography, University of Maryland. Uh, James Sturdivant, who's the Deputy Director, U.S. Geological Surveys, National Center for Earth, Earth Resources Observation and Science. Uh, Jay Fuquay, Coordinator, Land Remote Sensing Program at USGS. And finally, Woody Turner, who is the Program Scientist for Biological Diversity and Program Manager for Ecological Forecasting in the Science Mission Directorate of NASA. Uh, will also make comment. All these gentlemen making critical contributions to this publication, so we're thrilled that they can share their insights and their perspective on this new publication. I'm going to stop there because, as you can see, we have a lot of folks to hear from and, uh, and uh, a lot to hear about and also want to have a discussion with all of you. So I think I will turn the floor over to Fernando and then, uh, as we go through, ask John to chair the session. Good morning to everybody. Um, once again, my name is Fernando Echavarria, and I'm with one of the offices in the Bureau of Oceans, Environment, and Science at the Department of State, interested in a broad spectrum of U.S. UNEP activities, stretching all the way from uh, chemicals, environmental reporting, space applications. Mr. Turner, John Turner, the Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Oceans, Environment, and Science at State, meant to be here, but was called at the last minute this morning and has asked a team from OES to try and, and cover that broad spectrum of issues and interests that the department has on this relationship with UNIP. First of all, we wanted to uh, thank uh, Van and, uh, Brennan Van Dyke of UNIP and Jeff Debko from um, the Woodrow Wilson Center for organizing this event. The launch of this atlas is a good opportunity um, to help us um, educate the international community about the numerous positive and negative 
impacts of human activity on the planet. <clears throat> Using the remote sensing perspective of uh, satellite images, it is a very graphic way to look at and document the numerous environmental challenges and humanitarian needs that we're all working together to better understand and to address more effectively. The U.S. government is, wor is very excited um, to work with UNEP and others to make this publication, um, uh, the publication of this atlas possible. And most important, I think, for us uh, at State is to highlight the important contribution of U.S. government and non-government actors here. In particular, we want to praise uh, uh, NASA, the U.S. Geological Survey, and of course the was. University I'm of Maryland. Sure. Behind this example of U.S. UNEP collaboration that results in concrete re uh, results lies a very underreported initiative that has been going on for several years now which started with an announcement by NASA and the USGS of a Landsat data gift to the international community through UNIP. A total of 17,000 satellite images for three um, dates, uh, circa 1970s, 1990, and 2000. The estimated commercial value of that, of that data gift to the international community through UNIP is somewhere between 20 and $25 million. Um, it goes underreported, and it's really behind the wonderful examples. There's uh, 30 image pairs uh, and 30, uh, sorry, 80 image pairs and 30 case studies inside this atlas that's being rolled out today. But behind it is robust uh, data contribution on the part of the U.S. taxpayer to the international community for an important way to document baseline records of the state of the global environment. <clears throat> On behalf of the U.S. taxpayer, I want to tell you how proud we are of making not just a, a contribution to this atlas, put, but to this data gift that we've been pushing, both by posting it on the web and working with UNIB to delivery through actually um, through hard disks and CDs to the international community. <clears throat> we have been, throughout this process, particularly excited about what this data gift means for countries in Africa. Uh, on that note, we want to highlight the excellent example, the, the excellent contribution and work over the past three years that UNEP's Division of Early Warning and Assessment has done in trying to bridge the digital divide, for example, in places like Africa and actually get the data on the hands of at least one government agency and multiple non-government stakeholders in every African country. Beyond distribution of the data, and publishing of this atlas, our task is to help others make good use of it in order to improve the quality of life by addressing effectively many of the sustainable development challenges. The Department of State and the Bureau of Oceans, Environment, and Science has been working very hard in this goal through multiple initiatives, including one that we brought to the World Summit on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg called Geographic Information for Sustainable Development. GISD. Since the summit in 1992 in Johannesburg, in the name of GISD, for instance, we have hosted several workshops focusing on how to facilitate the satellite data to not only policymakers but technical experts and being able to ingest it into decision support systems that result in concrete action and effective response to multiple environmental challenges. Ultimately, we believe that projects such as GISD and this atlas being rolled out today uh, hold the key to improving the quality of people's lives all over the world. Assistant Secretary Turner, all of my colleagues at the Department of State want to congratulate UNIP <clears throat> for this wonderful atlas and the launching of it today and for helping us um, make note of the numerous challenges the world community has ahead um, that, that, that are so dramatically illustrated in the, um, in the atlas. We all look forward to, continues, to continue our work with the United Nations Environmental Program to advance our mutual goal of understanding and protecting natural resources um, all over the world. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Fernando. Um, our next speaker is Steve Lonergan, the head of the Division of Early Warning and Assessment. The United States, in its broad interaction with uh, UNEP, has long felt that the Division of Early Warning and Assessment was one of the true strengths uh, and foundations of UNEP and of an effective environmental uh, institution for the United Nations and a basis for sound environmental decision making throughout the world. Steve, uh, in his tenure at UNEP, has brought true leadership to DIWA, and we thank him for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, on behalf of the executive director of UNEP, Dr. Klaus Tupper, um, I welcome you to the launch. This is um, part of a series of launches for uh, this uh, global atlas entitled One Planet and Many People began about 10 days ago with World Environment Day launches in San Francisco and London. So this is kind of following up on that. The response so far has been uh, very, very dramatic. So we're, we're, we're quite pleased. And I have both a, a personal as well as professional interest in, in this uh, volume as well. Um, as both Jeff and, and John alluded to, um, I am director of the Division of Early Warning and Assessment at DIWA, or at uh, UNEP, uh, so-called DIWA, or at least I was until a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm actually um, leaving UNEP in a, in a week, a week from today, exactly, so my tenure at the organization will be over. Um, so right now I'm acting as special assistant or advisor to the executive director on scientific assessment issues, and have been based here in Washington for the last couple of weeks, which was fun until this heat wave hit a couple of weeks ago, and now it's not quite so fun. Um, but I, I, I have to, I'm not going to go into too much substance here, even though I'd really like to go steal some of Ash Bindu's thunder and talk about some of the, this, this evidence of environmental change that I use, have used in the past in my own work and we use in DIWA and UNEP. Um, but my association with this atlas began uh, right after I accepted the position to be director of DIWA a little over two years ago. And uh, the, the, the call I got right after the um, job offer was from Ashbindu Singh in Sioux Falls saying, I, I want you to come to Sioux Falls right away, knowing that as soon as I got to Nairobi, I would never come to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So lo and behold, in the next couple of weeks, he got me down to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where I had just a fascinating introduction to the Aeros Data Center and USGS and UNEP's involvement with USGS there. And it was just, it's just a wondrous place, actually, to visit. Um, and of course, the first thing we talked about was this Atlas of Global Change. I mean, before we even really sat down and talked about UNEP, he brought up this Atlas of Global Change, which had, had kind of a um, not so smooth evolution, should we say, over the previous couple years. But as a geographer, as somebody who was now directing DIY, I was very excited about this as well and thought we should move ahead and actually get this thing published. And it you know, should have been published a year or two before. So together, I think Ash Bindu and I agreed, let's get this thing moving. And, and I think the product we see now now um, really warrants the interest we had two years ago and for Ash Bindu bringing me down to this little place in South Dakota as the start of my UNEP career. So um, I'm very interested in this both personally as well as professionally as I'll mention in a second. Uh, this is a crucial type of um, evidence, space-based observation mostly in this volume for DIWA. We have two branches. We have our assessment branch where we really take stock of and provide evidence of environmental change. And this certainly is the best visual evidence we could have or we have to date on environmental changes that are occurring throughout the, the globe. Uh, and it really makes, in some cases, dramatic, uh, gives dramatic evidence of these changes. The other side of DIWA, of course, is our so-called early, early warning side, which is not so much early warning in the sense of early warning of tsunamis and so on, but really emerging environmental issues. And being able to track environmental change sometimes highlights certain environmental changes that we really need to keep on the radar of decision makers. And we'll look at the changing ice pack in the Arctic as one very clear example of that that Ash Bindu is going to present. So for DIWA, this is actually an extremely important product because it identifies the types of data and the types of evidence we use in our own work. Uh, and the last thing I think that has is, is, been crucial with this atlas is it also demonstrates 
the importance and the utility of partnerships. Uh, one thing I tried very hard when I came to UNAP was to develop partnerships with different organizations in different countries. There's certainly been a lot of tension over the years between the United States and the UN in general, and, and, and most people don't understand the very, very productive relationships that organizations have, you know, sort of at the lower level. So at, at UNAP, working very closely with USGS, with State Department, which has been a very good supporter, and I thank John and Margaret and others for that, um, and also with NASA and NOAA and so on, these type of partnerships, along with some help from universities like University of Maryland and John, um, all give us an enormous uh, um, amount of intelligence and evidence and background that we can put together atlases like this. So I, I think this is just a, a great um, uh, example of the types of partnerships that the UN, different government organizations, private research institutions can go through to produce um, um, uh, materials like this. I'm just going to give you a couple of examples that I want you to think about as Ashbindu goes through the more interesting substantive uh, and pictorial evidence that, that uh, we're going to show. And these are two projects that I've worked on in the past in my academic career and I will be going back to. One is looking at climate change in the Arctic. Work for the Canadian government and uh, really for the U.S. government as well. Looking at the types of change we're seeing in the Arctic, particularly with ice coverage, multi-year ice, the possibility of um, uh, no more multi-year ice and the effect that would have on oil drilling, natural gas drilling, fishing, indigenous peoples, and so on. There's some great examples that Ashbindu is going to show of the changing ice conditions in the Arctic, and this is something that personally I'm very interested in. And the second is most of my work, and I've, I've talked to here at the Woodrow Wilson Center in the past, has been on Middle East water issues. And there's three or four wonderful slides there about changes in that relate to land use in the Middle East, in particular water use. And I did some work about seven years ago for the U.S. government, um, the State Department, and, and the Canadian government on what was going on in the western desert in Egypt, where there was something called Mubarak's pyramids being planned to basically green up the western desert and to create a new Nile Valley. And, and the countries really didn't know what was going on there, whether or not this could possibly result in instability for the Egyptian governments if, they, if the government, if they were forced to publicly pay for a lot of these activities. Well, you're going to see some evidence of dramatic change in terms of irrigation and agriculture in the western desert from our satellite photos. And of course, the other examples we're going to show are the um, Ataturk Dam in Turkey, the damming up of the Euphrates River, which is affecting transboundary movements of water along the Euphrates with Syria and Iraq. And of course, the change in the Mesopotamia marshlands, which has actually been a positive story in the last couple of years that we can depict on satellite photos, and even the, the growth of wheat production in Saudi Arabia so that they are now this, the world's sixth leading exporter of wheat using fossil groundwater um, from a fossil aquifer to irrigate the wheat fields, and we'll show that as well. So I'm going to turn that that kind of interesting evidence and interesting pictorial discussion over Ashbindu. I just want to thank uh, Jeff, of course, for, for hosting this and also for the partners that we've developed here, the University of Maryland, the State Department, NASA, USGS. It's been a great partnership as an example, I think, what really can be done with multilateral organizations, um, individual country organizations, and of course, uh, research in the private sector. So thanks very much, and I think we'll turn it over to Ash Binu now to show some of the more interesting substantive material coming out of this work. Thank you, Steve. Um, as Steve alluded to, uh, we're very fortunate to have Ash Bindu Singh as our representative of DY in North America. Uh, Ash Bindu brought Steve here, or brought Steve to North America as one of his first steps, and has really been critical in um, moving this project along and in fostering a a positive working relationship with uh, not only U.S. government agencies but with the academic uh, NGO and business community as well. Uh, in North America. So thank you for being here and for the leadership that you've shown uh, here in, in uh, getting this effort uh, moving. Thank you, Ashmin. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, good morning. I wish we had a copy of the Atlas. We had only one copy for display because our binder in Malta where we got it printed, <laughs> he couldn't really produce enough copies. <laughs> uh, this Atlas actually is... Uh, I would say 
it had a little bit long history, a few years of history, where it took a lot to get it done. Uh, and I will just show some of the examples uh, uh, of the atlas. One is, so why, why, what did we do in this? The whole idea, we just wanted to capture what is happening where. We didn't want to do any value judgment on interpretation, why it is happening and how all those issues. We just wanted to see what is happening where. The why we did it, uh, one of the frustrations even I have been when I try to communicate about environmental change with people who don't know much about it, they just don't understand it, what I'm talking. When you say, oh, forests are disappearing, people just don't capture <laughs> what exactly it is. So the idea was really, hopefully it will help people to understand the way we are changing the environment. And I will show you within a week of this, uh, we are glad it made some impact. And how we did it, we are telling the story of environmental change, basically using current and historical satellite data, some short narrative and ground photographs. Because one of the things I learned in remote sensing is that just showing the satellite photograph doesn't help people <laughs> to capture their imagination, unless there is some attached ground photograph so they understand more what, what we are talking, because satellite photographs are mostly reflectance value. As I said, the basic objective was to provide a visu visual evidence of environmental change taking place around the world. And the assumption we had, we may be wrong on that, uh, but assumption we had that all saying that a picture is worth thousand words and seeing is believing. If people see that, they will believe in that. So that's the basic assumption in doing this. What we have in the atlas is, it's a 332 pages large format book. Uh, we have 80 sites around the world where we have current and historical satellite data. Some places actually we have more time series data than others. And we have 30 environmental case studies and narratives and images and ground photographs. And also we have some of the recent environmental maps. So mostly it's very visual atlas. In terms of the scope of the atlas, we try to focus on trend over time because that's what we think people pay more attention. If you say you have so much area under forest, still people don't understand what it means. But if you say that, oh, you are losing forest with this rate, they start understanding more. And also we try to capture those environmental change which can be easily visualized. So anything which we cannot visualize, we didn't try to put into this because uh, that's within the scope. And we try to look into the significant uh, changes, uh, which is visually, ap visually ap appealing, because if there is a deforestation of one hectare land, which may not be that interesting to people, because it's not very significant. We tried very hard to do regional and thematic balance, and I must say we didn't succeed that much because of various reasons. Because when I look, the atlas, not very ma many people will notice that we have three or four examples of Mexico alone due to different regions. <laughs> we did provide some contextual information. And the basic tool was really Lancer series of satellite data because it has the largest record of the Earth's surface starting in 1973. So that was the basic really tool for uh, Atlas. This is intended for really sensitizing, as I said, to policymakers, and hopefully non-governmental organizations will use it uh, to take to the uh, governments uh, to sensitize them and private sector. And also, our hope is it will provide resources on environmental change to academics, teachers, and citizens. In fact, during the first week of the launch, and I, we found that the second part has already started happening. Those who are not really that much in uh, uh, remote sensing business, they might recognize this image which came from Apollo, which one I don't remember, but this is the image which really led to the Earth Day, uh, creation of Earth Day in the United States, because first time people realized that we are living in one interconnected planet and it's how fragile this planet is. And that's really inspired people and which led to the Earth Day celebration. The evidence for the ozone 
layer really depletion, all the evidence really came from the satellite images. That time series tracking without satellite images, it was not possible really to track them. And all the, that's really led to Montreal Protocol, which you have really broken through. Uh, you know, a lot of us are aware about the deforestation in Brazil, uh, Amazonia, and you see this fishbone pattern here. Actually, this was the image which led to a lot of awareness about global deforestation issue. And now even Brazilian government itself is doing, using satellite data, regular monitoring of forest cover, so they can see almost year by every two years what is happening. There was no way with such large area you can monitor and see what's happening to the forest. The deforestation rate has again gone up, but the fact is that this is only tool to get it done. There's no other way to know it. Uh, this one uh, is a real example of Washington, D.C., closer to home, where uh, Mrs. Casey, she, she was so, after looking at some of the satellite pictures, she was so moved up that she put an endowment, and they started a Casey Tree Foundation, really planting trees in the district itself. So these are some of the examples just I wanted to show, as a, which has made impact. In terms of what Atlas cover, I will give one some representative examples what we have in Atlas. Uh, we know the world population is change, uh, changing, and most of people in future will live in urbanized world. So this is a city of San Diego in Chile, and you can see the difference what has happened to the last uh, 10, 20 years. But those changes are not only happening in cities. This is a, a kind of... Uh, within 100 kilometers of Lake Victoria in Africa. And if you see the red color, which is high population density, there have been dramatic changes. And that has a really impact on the pressure of the lake resources itself. <coughs> this is night light up image of the world, and you can see where most of people are consuming the energy. North America, Europe, uh, uh, you can see easily. Africa, you see very little light. It's just, you have to remember, it's an artifact. It's not reality, but that's how the world look like if you look in the night. And Africa, you can see really, there's very little light. And we know the energy consumption is going up, and it will keep on going up in future, uh, if you see the, what the numbers are. But we should be also aware, this is a good example of what happened to the, when there was a grid, uh, this blackout in eastern United States. And you can see that uh, before and after, all this light in New York and all that, most of them are gone. So uh, that kind of catastrophe can happen sometime. Uh, this is a... Basically, without satellite, if you see the red color, that what so the, how the pollutants are moving from really Mongolia and uh, across up to the United States. So how the transboundary pollutants are really moving, and without satellite data, it have, would have been very difficult to track them. There was no evidence that this is happening. That kind of thing is difficult to figure out. Still, we get a lot of pollution through the forest fire. It's one example in Africa. There are a lot of fires going on uh, throughout the year. Um, uh, and it has a major source of really uh, emission. Uh, as Steve mentioned, you can see the progressive la loss of uh, the ice cap really between the last 20, 30 years in Arctic. And uh, you, I won't be surprised. You can imagine an Arctic without ice. Uh, we don't know when it will happen, but it could happen. Mm. Mount Kilimanjaro, seen in 1973, all this where uh, now a lot of that is gone, sorry. Oh, oh, I, I think I made a mistake. <laughs> oh, okay. Let me just... Okay, this is uh, urban change, Las Vegas in 1973. You see this area, and then you see by 2000 how much uh, dramatically the Las Vegas has really expanded. And this is animation of the expansion of Las Vegas. There is a connected event happening close to Las Vegas. This is a Hoover Dam, a Lake Mead. And it's interesting to see one of our students, really, he took this photograph. Between 2000 and 2004, there have been drought. And you, it, it, this water level in Lake Mead has gone down by 18 meters. But never, what is happening, 
Next to that is a lot of these golf courses are still springing up. So there's a lot more water available for golf courses, though there's a drought in that area. So all these golf courses, really, they need a lot of water, but it's still <laughs> they are getting that. Uh, Florida Everglades, again, if you see, focus on this scene, which is really encroachment, urban encroachment, uh, that's happening right here. Uh, Mexico City, see the growth, dramatic growth in the city, and one can see the animation, how the city is growing in terms of its aerial extent. Then this, this is a shrimp farming in Honduras, and this one got really a lot of media coverage, I must say, around the world. And we had huge requests for uh, the, all these areas, mangrove forests have been really converted into shrimp farms. Uh, this is an example taken from China, and if you see how this, keep an eye here, how the rivers carry the siltation, and you see a lot of that area is already, delta has, because of siltation, there is such a huge expansion. Aral Sea, it's a very old story, and you just keep and watch on how it's really dying. I mean, most of it looks like 60% or more than has already gone. So it's a kind of, uh, one can visually see that what is happening. Same is with Lake Chad. If you see this uh, uh, blue color, that's all water in 72. And then water level really started shrinking. Uh, Lake Hamon, this one was a new example to us. I mean, Aral Sea and Lake Chad are well-known examples where things, uh, but this one I was surprised. If you see all this, uh, blue color here, Lake Hemu is some, on the border of Afghanistan and Iran. Most of the lake is already gone. It's only salt left. Yeah. Mesopotamia, this was, we did a couple of years back, really, this is study out of just curiosity, not that by any design. Uh, but all this were ma marshland in 73. By 2000, most of the marshes disappeared. So only this part was left. And if you watch that part, uh, even here, the part, a lot of them has disappeared by 2002. Only thing because of the flooding and some other measures, it looks like some of the masses are, if you see the, uh, the, these colors coming back. Uh, Steve mentioned about this uh, irrigation bringing to the desert, means uh, uh, all this black uh, color you can see, the water is coming and uh, there is a springing of agriculture actually in this area, in Egypt. Uh, impact of Atatru Dam, you can see because of there is more water here now, the dam, the irrigation has increased in this area. Uh, this is a class, other good example of Saudi Arabia where the, how the irrigation has really transformed the desert. And last week, actually, John Wiley and Sons in Kenda, they asked us, because there's somebody writing a textbook and they wanted some of them to be used in the textbook. So we are quite pleased that people have already started using within a week. This, this is another new example which came to us. We were not aware of that. If you see this area in Spain, and there are a lot of greenhouses came really in the last few years, between 74 and in the last 20 years, 30 years. All this white color, these are all greenhouses. I don't know why it's happening, whether there's some European Union policy or what, but a uh, uh, the lot of them, really. The whole area has changed. There's a huge land use change happening in Bolivia, and you can see the corporate agriculture has taken over the forested area in that landscape. Uh, this is an example of Paraguay, uh, uh, Brazil, and Argentina. And if you see here, in last, 30 years, and this one is, I think, World Heritage Site. Uh, uh, and if you see the example, most of the forests in Paraguay has disappeared in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, and you can see, almost see the boundary of National Park from there, really. Uh, this one is example of, uh, really, you can see Mexico-Guatemala uh, border, just based on deforestation. Most of forests in uh, Mexico has disappeared, and this is the Guatemala border. So basically you can see the border from the space purely based on deforestation between two countries. 
Papua New Guinea in the, uh, uh, sorry, you see, uh, uh, you see this forested area in 1990 in the Irian Jaya, which they changed the name, it's Papua now. Uh, and by 2000, this much area, I mean, basically they started some kind of, uh, I think it's an oil palm plantation. But if you keep an eye on this, this whole area is expanding. So a lot of forests have been really transformed into oil palm plantation. <coughs> Uh, this is happening closer to home here. If, this is British Columbia. There is uh, uh, logging going on. Whether it's enough regeneration or not, I don't know. But there is a uh, uh, lot of logging seems to be going on in this area, close to Canadian and U.S. border. Uh, this one is conversion of indigenous land to the cultivated agriculture in Kenya, where indigenous people, they live in this area. If you see that, a lot of that is being really replaced by cultivated agriculture. And you can see that bright color all over. Uh, this is a positive example. This is Lake Victoria. It has a lot of water hyacinth. And if you see some of these water hyacinth, even it's a huge area because you can see from eight, nine, six, seven hundred miles from its face. But by 2000, some of them had disappeared. So some of these things look to be the working, means where the invest, lot of investment has gone into. So there's some positive side where some, the, some of the interventions by government and international organizations seem to be working, and we have a proof. Yeah. Uh, this is an interesting example of uh, civil war in Liberia. Uh, and if you see the, where the refugees are coming from Liberia after the civil war, most of them are, and they are deforestating in Guyana. So Guyana can do very little, really. Refugees coming all over, and then deforestation is taking place in Guyana. So it's an example how this transboundary things impact other country. Uh, uh, this one is Papua New Guinea. You see there's a copper mine here, and it's uh, really this river is getting polluted. Uh, but if you look in 1990, it was basically discharge was this side, and by 2000, the discharge has gone this side. So basically, <laughs> that's how this mining is, one example of mining there. Uh, it's in Wyoming, Montana. You can see this area, uh, there's a coal mining there, with the expansion of railroad and all that. There's a lot of activity happening there. Uh, it's a, a diamond disc mine in Canada, and if you keep and watch on here, how it's a changing, uh, much bigger expansion happening here in Canada. Uh, this is just Mount St. Helena in the USA, uh, that volcanic eruption, how really, uh, after the eruption, uh, you have more volcanic ash, but some of the regeneration uh, vegetation is coming back. So it's a, uh, just a change because of that. This is one example of flood in Mozambique. Uh, lot of, uh, this is one of the recent images. I'm sure people have seen of tsunami in Bande Ache, and if you keep and watch, you see how this whole island has been impacted. Uh, uh, this one is a world. Uh, there was an earthquake long time back in Peru. Uh, the, and if you keep watch of this city here, I mean, it's just, and how the avalanche, most of things, the whole city was gone, really, except only this area is left. So it's uh, between 72 and uh, 60. Uh. Now, what we were surprised was, to be frank, <laughs> when we did the report, it was launched in San Francisco, London, and Geneva by UNEP. Within a week, we had uh, first four or five days, really, and it's, we, we, we are still counting the numbers, but we had over a one million hit on our website. There are more than 21,000 links in Google, 700 copies sold through online order, and 300 CDs distributed. Normally, in UN, we are unable to sell a lot of uh, uh, UN reports, but this one really is, even we don't have enough copies, but it's still 700 online orders. Four terabyte of PDF files were downloaded, equivalent to about 2,000 paper copy of the report. So we were really surprised with the how many people, how many people are really accessing and downloading that. We have, we have, we can't count everything. We have over 100 TV, radio interviews, and uh, online news, newspaper articles uh, around the world. In fact, this morning there is a Spanish uh, magazine. They just called me. They want to discuss. They want to have a feature article in 
some of the Spanish magazines. We have really inquiries from a number of independent booksellers, which is quite surprising in U for UN reports. And we have more about 20, 40 requests for critical review by magazines and all that. So we are quite pleased with the really with the uh, phenomenal response we had in first few days. And it's going on. Actually, we have problem now meeting all those demand on a, a regular basis. Some of the f initial feedback from the readers. Jack Dangerman, who is the president of ESRI in California, the largest GIS software company in the world. He, he called me and said, oh, I read it last night, find it very interesting and stimulating. And he wants 20 slides to be used during his user conference, which is really uh, attended by more than 12,000 users around the world. There are some other comments uh, uh, from average citizens, really, which is more inspiring to us that the, not only media, but the people uh, uh, on internet, they are reading and making comment. Uh, there are a lot of requests for the educational purposes, really, how to use the material and uh, 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 that kind of thing. You see one comment where somebody said, this, this satellite photo is very sad. We really see the level of destruction done to the large green space in the last 30 years. So, uh, it's a very personal kind of comments people are making, which is a good one. The best one I found, which I think we could have not summed up our, ourselves, uh, about the atlas, it was on internet. Uh, basically, he tried to say that okay, oftentimes showing what not to do, but occasionally showing examples what can work. So we are really, it's a very good review of uh, critical review <coughs> what we wanted to say. So we are quite pleased with the really response from average citizens, not only media, because that's what important was how to impact, how to uh, really connect them. Uh, there were a number of challenges in doing this kind of uh, really report. One was how do you collect information on a globally, I mean, when you have locally distributed sites around the world, it's not very easy to find some reliable information. I mean, satellite data is one thing, but providing some contextual information. Other problem was how do we maintain some regional and thematic balance? Uh, uh, that was hard. Still, I must say, acquisition, analysis, and packaging of satellite data in a user-friendly format is still quite a task. It takes a lot of time to do that. And I'm hoping, actually, even today in Washington Post, there was an article now. Recently, Google and Microsoft are trying to get into and provide the data, really, in a user-friendly format. So hopefully, when there is a commercial vendor like that, that might solve some of the problem. But it's still for average person, it's a difficult. Unfortunately, we don't have any operational monitoring system for a lot of these things. So that really creates a problem. When you are, we want to try to package it, there's no data. So you, you struggle through to start collecting a lot of data, which is expensive uh, and time consuming. The future plan is that we will create an interactive web version so more people can use it. We want to keep it like a live document, so we get more new sites. We keep on adding on our website, so more, it, it, it shouldn't be a static document. Uh, uh, we, we do want to do quickly a PowerPoint, so we can distribute to people on different regions, on different themes, so anybody can use it. And also my hope is if I can find some private sector partner really to put something like in chaos environment, like in the Smithsonian Museum, where every citizen can go and click and uh, really see that how the lake child is disappearing, or LLC is disappearing, just in a very user-friendly format. Uh, there is a reality that the earth is only place which we have, but uh, per capita availability of land is really going down. Uh, uh, we know that. I know if this is an advertisement which captures the, what current environmentalism is. This lady is saying, I would rather have a cleaner environment, but I can't imagine myself without my car. So that's really the, uh, what we have these days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ashbindu. Um, 
the United States is, uh, in, in working with UNEP, is always uh, encouraging them to reach out and uh, work more with um, institutions like uh, the government institutions that have participated here, but also reach out to the academic community, to, to NGOs and to private industry. Um, frequently, um, we've heard uh, comments that, well, the academic community does not want to meet us halfway, and obviously it's a challenge always working with governments or working with international organizations. But I want to say uh, thanks to John Townsend, who from the University of Maryland, who has been a part of this and who has been actively engaged in um, interacting with UNEP and with the, um, with the U.S. government on this project and others um, as it's gone forward. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much. Well, uh, uh, I'm not just simply the token academic on, on the panel. Uh, I do chair the advisory committee of DEWA for North America. And uh, as I'll talk about in just a short while, uh, it's a, a project uh, that I run, which was the source of uh, many of the images which you see, see within the atlas. What I wanted to do was to focus on just, and I'll be quite brief, to focus on one particular aspect of change which is manifested in so many of the examples uh, in the atlas, and that is of land cover and land use change. And I want to reflect on that and then make a few comments at the end in terms of where we should be going, where I think the US government should be going uh, in, 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 the f in, the, in the future. Land cover and land use change is one of those things which uh, we're all kind of aware of, but I think we begin to see that the cumulative changes over a period of years eventually end up to some quite dramatic changes in landscapes. And not only are those important uh, uh, because of what is happening visually, but they're also import incredibly important scientifically in the way they affect all, all sorts of different parts of the, of, of, of the Earth system. We also need information on these if we're to, uh, if nations are to support the various international agreements, which some have signed and, of course, some have not. It's also important that we understand the land cover change if we're to achieve sustainable development. Some of the examples you see in the atlas, there is sustainable development. There is conversion of forests into sustainable use. Other examples, I'm sure that's not the case. And then the whole issue of natural resources management and ecosystem services uh, are, are also key in this area. I just want to give uh, uh, an example, and of course, Ashbindu, since he roams so rapidly around the world, has stolen a little bit of my thunder. But uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, I, I think it's worth just giving a couple of examples. Uh, the, the, the first of which, and I hope this is going to work, is from... Uh, uh, Paraguay, which was referred to uh, by Ashbindu, and the interior Atlantic forest of Paraguay. And my guess is that, um, don't feel bad if you haven't heard about the interior Atlantic forest uh, 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 of Paraguay and uh, in, in, in other areas, um, but it is or was a very special uh, ecosystem. It's one of the most uh, biodiverse uh, 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 ecosystems in the world, uh, m uh, although it's outside of the tropics, more diverse than, than many tropical rainforests. And uh, this was essentially the state of the uh, uh, tropical rainforest, uh, sorry, of the uh, Atlantic forest uh, in 1973. And the little uh, uh, yellow lines uh, which you see, these are uh, uh, some uh, protected or, so or so-called protect protected areas. And what you see now as we move through to 83 and then through to 85, you see the progressive uh, uh, elimination of virtually the whole of this forest and therefore, of course, not only the uh, forests, uh, uh, the vegetation itself, but then also uh, all the uh, associated bird life in particular. And that is the situation as of just, just, just a few years ago. Uh, I don't think you're going to see anything very different if you look today, since virtually all the forest has actually disappeared. Is this a bad thing? Is it a good thing? I mean, if you're interested in biodiversity and you're interested in conservation, you look on it as being a disaster. It's a holocaust. It's terrible. If you look at it from the point of view of the campesinos, of the farmers that now occupy this area, who now produce uh, a wide variety of, of, of crops, 
perhaps you have a rather different perspective. And that's one of the challenges when we look at how our planet is changing, is to, is to recognize that uh, one person's destruction is another, is another person's gain. Uh, we did mention, uh, again, Ashbindu uh, mentioned Mato Grosso and what was happening uh, uh, there and the, the changes in Mato Grosso, and in fact there was an article in the Post, I think on Sunday, uh, highlighting this. Uh, the changes there are, 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 are very dramatic and, I, and I, I've struggled to try and show uh, 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 what, it's, what really is happening here. Uh, this is a field which stretches almost to the horizon. That took just over somewhere between a week and two weeks to clear. Right? This is the most incredible land cover conversion that has, I think has happened anywhere on the planet. The sheer speed at which it's occurring is absolutely, absolutely enormous. Again, you say, well, does this matter to us? Should we just be very sad that we've lost so much forest? Well, I think it's going to matter to the uh, U.S. farmer as well. Uh, there is not much of a road infrastructure here, but uh, Mato Grosso is selling their soy at a, at a lower price than the, than the U.S. farmer can, can, can do so. And once they get that road infrastructure, there's going to be a, a considerable potential impact on, on, on U.S. farmers because of what is happening here. So I guess that's another message one needs to get over, is one often sees these local changes, and you think, well, it's a local change, and therefore it affects those people locally. But often the changes which we're seeing, because cumulative they, they're so large, they start to have international global impacts. And what is happening to, to the world's land cover is starting to affect us uh, uh, all dramatically. We've talked, or uh, mention has been made of the key role of Landsat uh, in providing much of the information on land cover change. Uh, the sad news is, is that uh, uh, Landsat uh, uh, is sick. Uh, it's uh, got severe problems, particularly when one comes to looking at land cover changes. And uh, you see that the, that the problems, if you look on the left-hand side of the image, you see by the time you get to the outside parts, that's just a slice through the image, you get really quite large gaps. And this is not good for reliable land cover change detection. Uh, when you're near the center of the image, it's not so bad. Uh, but this is a real problem. We have another Landsat, which is uh, remarkably uh, limping along, uh, but it can't provide the overall acquisition. What's so great, has been so great about Landsat, is not just that it was a nice sensor which produ would produce good data, but the whole way it was organized in terms of the downloading of data meant that we got global coverage on a regular basis that had never before, uh, before been achieved. That means you can look literally at everywhere in the world more or less, uh, uh, more or less annually. The good news is that the US uh, government has decided that Landsat will become operational and not just become something which every so many years NASA desperately tries to convince people that it's needed for research in research terms. It's now become operational. It will become uh, it will be uh, operating uh, uh, in the long term, but that's not going to happen until 2010 uh, at, at, at the earliest. And so, in a very real sense, we've gone blind, right? or we've certainly lost a large proportion of our vision. It's gone. We can't see the sorts of changes which we've been able to see, which have been so dramatically shown. That capability now has largely disappeared uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of use of Landsat data. So what happens next? Well, excuse my misspelling. Uh, uh, there are, in fact, plenty of similar instruments actually flying, which could provide us useful data. But they're largely owned by other countries, and other countries have their own priorities, and they often are more interested in looking at their countries rather than taking a more global perspective. But I think there's a real challenge to the US and to other countries to try and use these other assets to bring together some sort of acquisition strategy so we do get that overall view of what's happening to the Earth, what's happening to the Earth's land cover, and to the other aspects of the environment. Uh, recently, uh, the US, uh, along with, I think it was 
50 odd other nations agreed on something which was called the Global Observing Earth Observing System of Systems, GEOS, and that is to enhance coordination between nations in terms of providing the data which are required. I would suggest it's a major challenge to the US and to that organization to try and ensure that we get at least some resemblance to the excellent quality of Landsat data that previously we, ha we had had. <clears throat> Let me just make a few words about the importance of uh, making data available. Lots of people, lots of nations put satellites up and many, many of those satellites don't actually provide much useful information because the information doesn't get out to people. The US has been an is the outstanding nation in the world for providing its data openly and readily available to anyone that wishes to download the data. The US provides the, exa the international example in terms of data policy. One of the ways, in, uh, one of the consequences of that is that anybody who uh, gets hold of Landsat data uh, can then distribute it quite freely. If you have to go to the US Geological Survey, you have to pay initially, but once you've paid, you can then copy it freely and make it available to anyone. Uh, a, something called the Global Land Cover Facility is where many of these data were uh, downloaded from, and this is a, a NASA funded activity at the University of Maryland where we have an interface so that anybody can just download data uh, at, at, at any time. And we have two complete coverages of the whole of the Earth's surface and a, and, and a little bit more than that when it comes to Landsat data. It's nothing like as comprehensive as the holdings of the US Geological Survey, but it has a number of desirable uh, characteristics. Uh, I guess the most important one is uh, on the right-hand side. It's the right price, which is zero dollars. Um, we also have a very large bandwidth. Now, just to understand the impact of being able to make data readily available, note the last two bullets. Every month, approximately, people download from our site 30,000 scenes uh, per month of Landsat data. That's a lot of data. That's over 10 terabytes of data being down, down, downloaded every month. The maximum amount of, of Landsat scenes ever sold by USGS in one year was 16,000. So we're distributing in a month almost twice as much as the maximum ever distributed by USGS in one year. And it's not because we're in some sense uh, 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 smarter, though, we like to think we are, but it's not because we're so much smarter. It's because of current uh, policy with respect to Landsat data, and Landsat data in this respect is, is I think, uni unique, which really handcuffs the USGS and makes it difficult to make their data available in the way that nearly all other environmental science data uh, that, that are from the US are made available. We've uh, fortunately been able to open the floodgates and now people download these scenes at, at, at a tremendously rapid rate uh, throughout the world. I would say roughly 50% of the use is non-US, roughly 50% is, 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 is US. Um, one of the, the themes of, uh, what, uh, of, of this uh, morning has been how we can understand how things are changing and how we can make assessments of longer term change. I just want to mention, uh, uh, give a couple of examples of other sorts of changes which we can now observe much, much more quickly. I want to refer to, in particular to rapid response systems, uh, which, uh, for example, uh, make available information on the distribution of fires uh, worldwide. Anybody can log into these sites. I logged in yesterday. And this is the fires, the, the, the red dots that you can hopefully see. That, that's the distribution of fires in Madagascar yesterday. Right? And it's very important often to get this, not only to take the longer term perspective, but also to take advantage of these technologies in order to uh, uh, respond quickly. And this is the sort of information which is uh, utilized by the US Forest Service in making strategic decisions in, during the fire season in the allocation of, do we put so many C-130s here? Do we move so many firefighter, firefighters there? Uh, this is work which is led by Chris Justice uh, uh, from, from, from my department uh, in cooperation with people from NASA and US Forest Service. But then, uh, 
somewhat remarkably, uh, people are now starting uh, to use this uh, information uh, even for tactical firefighting. That is knowing where a specific fire is. And this is, uh, we, we used to remotely sense data. Uh, the main way in which it becomes available is uh, through looking at an image. But uh, as you can see in this example, this can also be a source of information from remotely sensed data. Because what happens, and this is a, a, a prototype developed by Diane Davis from my department, and uh, this is w w in, in, in uh, South Africa, is that uh, it, the information on the location of fires is processed and then messages are automatically sent to specific people telling them the where the location of fires are. And then they use that information actually to go and make sure those fires get put, get put out. Primarily of concern to people associated with utilities and being concerned about uh, fires, for example, dis 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 destroying uh, 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 te either telephone or, or electric uh, networks. So what's the future? There are a number of issues which I think, if we're, if, if we're going to move on from where we are, there are a number of issues which are really important. First of all, we do have to have improved sharing of data between nations. That idea of the GEOS to do that is a great ideal. To achieve it is going to be tough. But we really do need that. We really need other countries to come forward in the way that the US has stepped forward in sharing data. We need reliable consistent global monitoring of land cover. The point that Ash Bindu made was we don't have operational systems. I think it's great that we've got an atlas with 80 case studies. What I want is a system which looks at the whole world, not just case studies, the whole world on a regular basis, because without that, we will not understand what is happening to our planet. We have to make sure that data, and more importantly, information, is available in a timely fashion for everyone. And we want to see the, the day arising quickly where real-time systems, real-time information becomes the norm. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, John. Um, our next speaker is from USGS and the, the work um, that has really gone on and the relationship with DWA has been hosted by USGS, uh, Steve alluded to the Eros Data Center and, and uh, the generous work and, and collaboration um, that they have led in terms of the, the uh, cooperation with UNEP. And uh, so I'd like to introduce Jim Sturdivan, who will say a few remarks. Thank you. Yes, I am from that little place in South Dakota. The US Geological Survey serves the nation by providing reliable scientific information to describe and understand the earth, minimize loss of life and property from natural disasters, and protect the quality of life. So that's why it's such a fitting partnership between the USGS and the United Nations Environment Program. Also, the USGS National Center for Eros, E-R-O-S, Earth Resources Observation and Science out in South Dakota. Uh, we're working to assess the Earth's landscape through remote sensing technology. So it's a very fitting partnership between USGS Eros and United Nations Environment Program, North American Node for, for GRID, Global Resource Information Database, which is located right there at Eros. Uh, I, by the way, I encourage you all to visit Eros in South Dakota. You'll like it. It's cooler there. <laughs> yes. Also, as has been said already several times this morning, the USGS owns the Landsat satellites, and the Atlas is chock full of Landsat imagery. Landsat, as you've already heard, is the longest running enterprise for the acquisition of moderate resolution imagery of the Earth from space. Landsat 1 was launched in 1972, the most recent Landsat 7 in 1999. As you've heard, Landsat 5 and 7 are still operational, but they have some problems. But we have three decades of global coverage of Landsat imagery. USGS is also responsible for that 30-plus year archive and making those data available to the world. Maybe you've heard of a thing called 
the National Satellite Land Remote Sensing Data Archive, which is a unique archive that uh, is located as well at the Eros Center in South Dakota. So a team of folks, many organizations, have worked to ensure the availability of Landsat and other land remote sensing data for the past 33 years, allowing all of us this insightful view of our planet provided by this atlas. All of us must continue to ensure the continuity of continuous global, uh, global collection of Earth imagery from space. Uh, let me just uh, quickly say I'm uh, Jay Fuqua. I'm the program manager for land remote sensing uh, out of USGS headquarters. Uh, I am in the happy position of uh, uh, providing the funding so that the work that uh, Jim talks about can be done. So I don't actually have to do any of the work, but I can uh, take most of the credit and I'm, I'm trying, and trying to, to desperately do so right now. Um, uh, John indicated that uh, Ashbindu stole his thunder by traveling around the world and seeing change. John th uh, stole my thunder because what I was going to talk about was the uh, uh, global uh, Earth Observing System of Systems, or GEOS, and I think John did a very nice job of setting up uh, the fact, maybe perhaps not emphasizing enough how uh, bought in the, uh, at the ministerial political level uh, these 60 by now uh, odd countries are, uh, this is a real uh, opportunity to make, to address some of the challenges that Ashbindu and, and John spoke about, about, about uh, operationalizing systems, data sharing, um, uh, uh, ensuring continuity. Uh, I am very happy to report uh, that the U.S. is at the forefront of this, uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, activity uh, in parallel with the uh, GEOS 10-year um, plan for Earth uh, for a global system of uh, systems, uh, the U.S. has produced its own strategic plan for an integrated Earth observation system. Uh, USGS, NOAA, NASA, uh, many other federal agencies contributed to, the, uh, to that. Uh, we're going forward on that. Uh, two things to point out are that currently today, USGS. Uh, NASA, other federal agencies are actively working with um, these uh, uh, other uh, countries who have uh, remote sensing data and working uh, to put together agreements to try and at least uh, mitigate uh, a, any possible gap in Landsat data that will be, uh, uh, that might be on us uh, before the uh, launch of the successor system uh, in uh, uh, late calendar year 2009. Uh, and uh, that um, seems like I had a second point, uh, and also I'll, what I'll say is that uh, uh, that uh, we are uh, very much committed uh, to the continuity of both uh, the Landsat system in its current form uh, to produce uh, uh, imagery that, uh, while it does have some problems, I guess I would uh, push back a little bit on John. I think that there is uh, uh, continued value that's uh, being. Uh, uh, produced by the Landsat 7 system and uh, the successor system, uh, the operational land imager uh, that will uh, um, usher in a, uh, a new uh, era in uh, uh, Earth remote sensing. So, again, uh, apologize to Ash Bindu for any uh, inconvenience at my late arrival. I uh, uh, hope you appreciate the fact that we didn't do any slides and uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. And last but not least, um, I'd like to introduce Woody Turner from NASA. NASA has been a critical partner in the cooperation with uh, UNEP and with USGS, NOAA, and the other federal agencies and, and, and others um, for many, many years. And Woody has coordinated that effort. And thank you. Thanks, John. Um, NASA is pleased to be here this morning and, and pleased to have played somewhat of a catalytic role in both getting some of the imagery uh, to Ash Bindo so that he could produce this lovely, uh, lovely book that's been launched, as well as uh, in, in bringing together a community of folks to provide imagery uh, to, the, to the broader user community. It, it, it strikes me that uh, we've been looking at the Earth, at land cover from space, for, for just over 30 years now. And I think for most of us, when you first view a satellite image, like a Landsat image or, or Aster or some similar Earth land sensing image, 
it's sort of, it, it's often initially fairly sort of disorienting, like sort of confusing this mosaic of colors, and you're, you're looking at this thing, and it's sort of, hmm, now wait, trying to figure out where this, where this is. Sometimes it's in false color, the greens are reds, and it's just, you know, it, it's sort of a little disorienting. But if, if you spend some more time with it, I think your next sort of, at least my next impression was that uh, it's, it's actually sort of, sort of beautiful. It's, it's, it's attractive. The, the, the beauty of our planet comes through, through the imagery. And in fact, give USGS and EDC credit for capitalizing on this. They've actually developed a program called Earth is Art, where they've taken a series of Landsat images and, and, and display them as, as, as beautiful artwork, as, as, as they are. And so one sort of spends a little more time looking at it, and you start thinking, hmm, this is, you know, this is not a bad place. Um, in which you live, it's really quite attractive. And then as you spend a little bit more time, uh, and this is where it really gets, um, gets useful, I think, you start to sort of put yourself in the landscape that you know looking outside your window at the office or outside the window of the car as you're driving to work into this broader context in which it, in which it exists, a broader regional context. And that context is really what I think remote sensing and satellite imagery has brought. Ash Bindu did a, does a real nice job of sort of plugging the importance of, of satellite imagery to, to kicking off uh, the first Earth Day and, and having a key role in sort of energizing the early environmental movement. And I, and I think that's justified. I mean, of course, I'm a NASA guy. What else am I going to say? But I, I do think there's some some legitimacy there that, that when you step back and start viewing the Earth at these different scales and then putting yourself into that, it, it, it makes us all much more connected. And, 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 it, and it forces us to consider what, we, the, what we're doing to, the, to, to our own landscape and, and, the broader, and the broader planet, the impact of our actions. And we're certainly, I think everybody here would say, having, a, having an impact locally. We can look out the, the window and see new developments going up and say, gee, you know, that wasn't there five years ago. Look what's going on. This is, this is interesting. But the imagery actually helps you sort of look at it at the regional and even the global scales and realize the impacts we're having at those broader scales. And John and his presentation, Ash Bindu and, and, and his, have done a very good job of sort of setting that, setting that up and, and, and I greatly appreciate that. I want to, before I step down, pull something from Fernando's talk. He, he mentioned the fact that um, essentially the, the group assembled here in, in addition to, with the addition of the Earth Satellite Corporation uh, in Maryland got together, that's NASA, U.S. Geological Survey, University of Maryland, UNEP, and with, with a fair amount of prodding from the State Department, Fernando was sort of riding herd on us at NASA for a while on this project, have gotten together and produced a three-epoch global data set, three epochs, data from the 70s, circa 1990 and 2000. And this is a unique, unique data set, over around 20,000 scenes of data that allow us to look at change over time. And you've seen the fruits of it, both in, in, the, in the publication that's, that's, that's before us, as well as Ash Bindu's and John's talks. What that allows you to do in sort of understanding, in understanding that change. I think we're ready now to take the next step. The data are out there, and I sort of want to put a call out to the broader community uh, here and, and out on the web to take advantage of this global data set and start doing those assessments, be they at the national scale, regional scale, continental scale, or even global scale. It's time now, the data are there, to look at change and to do a scientifically valid, relevant uh, hard-nosed look at changes in land cover since the 70s uh, around the world. Uh, uh, Tony Jan Janatos was here earlier from the Heinz Center, and, and he and John, a few, uh, actually over a decade ago now, started something called the Pathfinder Project, which was a precursor, a prelude to the Earth Observing System, so-called EOS, that NASA was, was getting underway at, at that time. And they did some very large sort of almost continental, regional, certainly scale, looks at changes uh, between the 70s and 80s and getting into the 90s. I think we're ready for another pathfinder out there using this, these, this global, these, these three epochs of global data. There's also a, uh, an effort just getting started, sort of nascent now, to get a 2005, 2006 global data set. Uh, it would be great if we could take advantage of ground stations to pull down the data from Landsat 5 while it's still up there. You know, God bless that satellite still running after 20 years. Let's get every bit of data out of it we can and fill in some of the holes with portable ground stations and get a Landsat 5 2005, 2006 global data set and then do a stretch that assessment of change from 2000 on out. Uh, I think uh, future generations would, uh, would uh, really appreciate that. Uh, and with that, I want to uh, thank uh, UNEP for allowing me to get up here and, and, and stand on my soapbox, and, and thank you for your time.
Thank you, Woody. I'd like to now invite the speakers back up to the podium and we can answer any questions that, that uh, might be out there. Specifically, um, I did want to, uh, to follow up on Fernando's uh, original remarks. Uh, this has been a truly amazing effort that has gone into the assessment process and um, wanted to simply note that uh, the U.S. government cooperation with UNEP uh, goes beyond simple assessment but, but, uh, and goes beyond the agencies that you see here uh, in terms of trying to address the problems. Uh, as we've seen these images uh, look at land use changes and, and most of those decisions are made on a local, regional, or um, a national level within the countries where they take place. We have uh, provided the information, Woody just talked about a, a major effort that has gone on in which uh, we are providing uh, data sets and those data sets going to de some developing countries that don't even have internet connections that are sufficiently robust to be able to download some of the data uh, off of the web in terms of providing hard drives and, and assisting those governments then um, so that they can make decisions about land use planning uh, involving local and regional people who can, uh, individuals who are, are, whose lives are being affected. Um, but I simply would like to note that, uh, that USAID, that EPA um, is, is working, utilizing some of these in, in cooperation. I see some AID folks out there. EPA has been an, an active player in working with UNEP and addressing these issues. NOAA, um, through our regional, the regional seas programs of UNEP, UNEP isn't simply assessment and monitoring. Uh, UNEP does a great deal more in trying to address the issues and assist governments uh, in their ability to be able to make uh, informed environmental decisions as they go forward. So with that, uh, if we have questions, uh, uh, maybe we could take them, begin them now. Uh, we have microphones here. And I think that it would be best if you could introduce yourself. Uh, it would uh, be appreciated. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, I'm Jim Baird with the Isaac Walton League of America, and congratulations to all of you. Uh, Tremendous stuff. Um, I'm struck, I guess, uh, the, the images are obviously very powerful. I, I wonder also about um, taking sort of the next step in, in looking at some of maybe explanatory factors or, or causative factors. If you, if you look at some of the images and then look at some of the information that might be available uh, on the ground or from other sources, putting that together to look at sort of the whys or the so what. A um, couple of examples that, that came to mind, your um, images of the tsunami and the, uh, the aftermath. I, I believe there's some research out there looking at where coral reefs were intact and were not intact and the, and the impacts. And so whether something like that could be pulled together and whether any of you are working on that or whether maybe any of you in the audience might be pulling that together to, again, uh, I guess put a finer point on some of the lessons that could be learned. Thanks, Jim. Uh, and uh, if anybody wants to join that question, I'd, I'd uh, certainly welcome that. I would uh, put a plug in for another UNEP publication, which is called After the Tsunami, uh, which is available, uh, I believe, and, and uh, we can probably get you the details on that, but it does outline some of the response that, that UNEP has given. There's, of course, uh, the U.S. government and agencies are, are very active in, in this effort. Fernando? Um, Woody, Woody has asked me to make sure that I, I just point out that right now we have a project that uh, IUCN, John Wow, is doing at putting, it to, putting together a data set, uh, working with JPL in Pasadena, uh, bringing the use of a new data set, mainly Aster data, um, and and we're looking at looking uh, at at the application of those of, of that data set to to uh, looking at the integrity of the coastline in this case of Sri Lanka. Um, there is a very complex process underway in Sri Lanka. In the aftermath of the tsunami, the president made 
a, a unilateral decision to set a 150 to 200 meter setback line. In other words, keeping people out of that coastal area for reconstruction. Huge political backlash causing all kinds of problems, including supporting the insurgency, et cetera. And IUCN is trying to bring to the fore these new data sets to help the government of Sri Lanka um, to, to, to look at the actual information, the integrity of the, of the, the coastal marine, the, the mangroves, in addition to the coral reefs, on to see how this, this needs to be uh, better managed and, and integrated into decision support systems. And again, you see the partnership between, in this case, actually, the Bureau of Oceans, Environment, and Science working with JPL and other NASA uh, programs, as well as the non-governmental organization, in this case, IUCN, um, John Wow. Please work with us, with those three actors, and we can provide you more information on in the case at least of Sri Lanka, this could be expanded and be a, just a pilot that can be taken to the entire Indian Ocean Basin. I know AID, who is not on the podium, also has a, a robust uh, coastal zone management program and, and does a lot of work, but Steve also had some information. Yeah, I, mean, I think a lot, a, lot of, a lot of organizations are working in this area, and uh, what, what we've done at UNEP is We've, it's just about ready to come out. It's under review now, a booklet looking at the buffering capacity of coastal ecosystems vis-a-vis -vis the tsunami, so not just corals but also mangrove ecosystems, and then following it up probably uh, only at the request of certain governments who have asked UNEP to come in and assess um, what the impacts have been um, in, in regions where there have been mangrove systems, where there have been coral systems and so on, versus those where, where these systems haven't existed to kind of get an assessment of the value of those. So I think a number of groups are actually working in this area, but we, we, we started very quickly, you know, right after the tsunami of saying, okay, wh what is the evidence right now on the buffering capacity of these systems from around the world, and now try to track it over time. Um, in, in the region. Uh, the other thing I'll say is that, the, of course, um, the, what we've shown here is the evidence of, of change, of environmental change. And as, as John said, it's not necessarily that this change is good or it's not necessarily as bad. There's just evidence of it. And the next step is to do studies that we've done and others on uh, areas like Mes Mesopotamia marshlands where, you know, the reasons for the change could be hydrological, they could be a geopolitical, socioeconomic, it's all, all kinds of reasons behind this. And, of course, we've seen change take place in terms of the drying up of the marshlands, and now actually it looks like there's, a, there's a, been some restoration of the marshlands as well that UNEP and, and the U.S. government and others have been involved in. So there's a whole story behind that. You know, we, all we wanted to do is to make, make a case for how, how strong the evidence of change, the visual evidence of change is. And then, as you say, there's, there's enormous and wonderful and rich stories behind each one of these. Jay, I think you also had. Uh, yeah, I do guess I'd like to take just a little bit of a different tact on that question. I think underlying it is uh, a problem or a situation that was highlighted by most of the speakers, and that is we're halfway there. If at best we collect all of this stuff, I mean, the question shouldn't be is somebody looking at this, but uh, why isn't uh, the data more openly uh, accessible, and whether that barrier is technical and training or cost or what have you, but uh, you know, wouldn't we wouldn't we all be better off uh, if uh, more of those kinds of case studies or uh, uh, or investigations could be taken without having to have that funnel that we're uh, currently going through of uh, once we collect the data of it being, being uh, overly difficult to get access to it. Thank you, Jay. We have a question in the back. Hello, uh, my name is Portland Wilson and I'm from the U.S. Census Bureau. I was just wondering, uh, was the government uh, printing office involved in the print of this project at all? No. <laughs> no, it's a UNEP publication, so <laughs> basically no. There was no U.S. government involvement in terms of printing. Sir, at the back. I'm Harry Warren, USDA, Natural Resources Conservation Service. Very impressive piece of work. Congratulations to everybody. One of the problems is we have 
systematically paid attention to remotely sensed information without a parallel effort of similar magnitude for trying to gather the ground truth information. Consequence of this is that we come across publications where people try to interpret the changes and that becomes subjective, that becomes questionable. My question is, how can we, as international people of international concern, mount a program to help countries do their monitoring work? Because without that ground truth monitoring work, which very few countries have, in fact, I'm a soil scientist in the area of soils, apart from the US, probably nobody else has, we are always going to be subjective. Thank you very much for, for that question. And actually, that issue came up at the Governing Council. And, and uh, UNEP has taken a major step uh, forward. And, and we've, I've, I've got to um, uh, gladly uh, note that the US was, uh, was active in, was a leader in promoting this and, and actively trying to build the capacity of governments to, to take up the monitoring and, and utilize it, but also to ground truth the information, to augment it with information on chemicals, and, and uh, so it's not simply land use, but it goes beyond that uh, to gather inf other, broader information so that they can make uh, decisions which promote sustainable development. But John, you also had some comments. Yeah, I, I mean, it's always possible that people can get hold of images and start making all sorts of interpretations. Uh, I don't know of any reputable journal which would publish the results of the use of uh, uh, satellite data without thorough validation being included. It, it, it just would not happen. So I'm not saying people don't do these things, but I'm saying that uh, the, the scientifically rigorous work... Uh, uh, is, is, now, is now the norm, and uh, there's been a lot of work be, which is continuing to be carried out on getting uh, international standards of validation, international procedures, so that uh, when I quote a particular set of accuracy figures, and I, I can quote a set of procedures, and everybody knows what that means, and everybody can re 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 reproduce it. So, you know, we're trying to work towards this. It's, it's, it's difficult because mandates of different organizations are, are also different. So our mandate has tended to be global, regional, and not so much local. And now we're increasingly looking at local level data issues as well. So I think, I think we recognize this concern. It, it's a major problem, but we're trying to work with that in terms of building capacity in a lot of the countries that, that don't, either don't have capacity or enhance their capacity, or the data just don't exist, which is a, even a bigger problem. I, Fernando mentioned a, a partnership that was launched at the WSSD, uh, working with USAID and in, in utilizing data for land use planning decisions in, East, in, in Africa as well. I know that other agencies, uh, USAID and, and NOAA and, and the Weather Service are actively engaged in assisting countries uh, as diverse as those in Central Asia and Southeast Asia as well in trying to uh, bolster their ability to monitor and assess information and to utilize it in planning. But we've got com comments here from both Woody and I think Jay. Um, remote sensing without uh, validation is, is, is not only flawed, it's, without ground truth, as you say, is not only flawed, it's, it, can be, it can be dangerous. The challenge is not necessarily to make remote sensing people soil scientists, but to, to make the tool, the remote sensing tool, more accessible to soil scientists. And there's sort of two ways you can do that. One, you can, you can train and, and raise the, you know, make uh, more soil scientists remote sensing experts. And, that, and people, people do that, and that's great. And there are departments that, that, that are working uh, sort of in an interwoven fashion to do that. Another way that, that NASA through Jet Propulsion, the Jet Propulsion Lab out at Pasadena, California has been exploring is to make the tool itself as simple as possible. And we've been focusing on a tool for protected areas that would essentially make JPEGs of images available, very uh, simplified version of images available with uh, a few annotation tools, things that you can do, 
trace distances, get areas of an out, uh, get the area of a, of a polygon that you draw on the map, et cetera. Just to get something into the hands of, of, in this case, protected area managers, they can take out in the field with them and do the do that work themselves. And so the access barrier, I think, has come down greatly over the last, certainly the last 30 years, due to the efforts of, of folks at, at, at EDC and places like John's uh, Global Land Cover Facility at University of Maryland. But we can still take it down, I think, another notch, uh, and just in making the tool as 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 simple as it as it can be, so that one doesn't need to be a GIS or remote sensing expert to to use uh, satellite imagery. And I was just going to comment that uh, in your question, you asked uh, what kind of uh, international uh, framework, or if I can paraphrase, might be available to to uh, push the importance of the in situ measurements. And uh, I guess I, I am uh, happy to uh, be able to say that the charter of both the uh, international uh, global observation activity and the U.S. activity uh, insists that integrated in situ measurements be, uh, be part of the total system. So uh, it is the problem that you raise is being recognized both nationally and internationally. Uh, images are quite compelling and alluring, so there's always a challenge to make sure that uh, uh, folks with a level head like yourself uh, stand up and, uh, and say, yeah, let's make sure we have it tied to the ground. But uh, that's, there's no lack of interest and, uh, as you've heard from the other uh, uh, folks, no lack of progress in that area. I know that your own um, um, department is also working on this and, in fact, in cooperation with the scientific societies that um, uh, the Agricultural Research Service is working with the uh, Ecological Society of America and working on the development of an ecological knowledge network that they are promoting in terms of trying to bring together experts that are knowledgeable about the remote sensing information as well as the soil science and the hydrology and putting that kind of uh, network together and at the disposal of decision makers at a local, regional, and national level so that they can make better informed decisions. Uh, right here in the middle. Um, my name is Isabel Mania from the Rural Resources Institute, and I work for our Global Forest Watch initiative. And I'd like to congratulate you. We're obviously big fans of remote sensing in general. And um, just to give a little background, I have a few comments and then um, a couple questions. Um, Global Forest Watch uses remote sensing data to provide information for decision makers and local institutions so that behaviors can be changed on the ground. Uh, we're a network of, of NGOs, of government institutions around the world that, that use this information. And we actually work quite a bit with UMD. And our Russian partners and partners around the world get free access to Landsat data and have actually been applying this um, everywhere. So this work is actually being applied. It's really exciting. In Cameroon, we were working with the Ministry um, of Forests, and we are mapping logging roads using Landsat. We're also very scared about the problems with, uh, with Landsat, and we are also going blind. So um, what I'm interested to find out in that respect is, um, well, this GEOS that, that was talked about, what are the challenges to this? Because um, the decisions that need to be, well, the behaviors that need to be changed in order for some of these more uh, dramatic changes to stop um, are really, these decisions are being made by policymakers who tend not to understand um, the technical aspects of this work. Um, so is it these decision makers that would uh, prevent GIOS from moving forward? What are the challenges? Are the challenges financial? Um, and also, can, how can we help to make the case for why applying this information at the local level can help to change the, uh, the behaviors of those that are affecting these landscapes? That's one question. Um, <laughs> um, uh, the financing. Um, another question is, um, we, we talked a little bit about, about networks. What, how can we help to move these networks forward? Um, and particularly, I'm interested in, in, in forest ecosystem networks. Um, what, what can be done here? Um, apart from financing, financing is always a question. Um, we work quite a bit with USAID, quite a bit with state, um, and uh, we're interested to find out how we can get it moving. Uh, 
Thank you. In the absence of Noah being here, uh, Jay has great, or graciously uh, decided he would uh, field the GIOS question here. I've been to several of the meetings, so um, the, a specific answer to part of your question on GIOS is the, the power of it is that those decision makers are the people who are behind GIOS. Those are the min ministerial level people from around the world that are doing that. Now, if I can take uh, John's cue and um, remove myself th from the debate of whether the change is good or bad, I'll, I mean, uh, advocates work, uh, uh, on issues can work with those decision makers. Um, they are convinced that um, the uh, that. The, 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 the challenge is to get that information out of the technical feedback loop of, well, we've got a better model, we've made a better paper, let's get better observations, and proactively feed that information into the decision-making cycle. So that will, that will be the challenge of having folks who live more in the policy world help the folks in the technical world pull that information and, and funnel it through those decision-making channels. The good news is the folks responsible for the decisions have expressed that interest and support. Then I'll defer to anybody else who wants to answer any other questions. John? Perhaps to uh, offer uh, an, another word of encouragement with respect to GIOS, I think that one of the wise decisions that was made there and also in the U.S. National Plan is that the, uh, the, the, the both, both plans, both strategies are structured around uh, areas of societal benefit. Instead of talking about the observables, you first of all talk about societal benefit areas. And I think this struck a real chord with, uh, uh, with, with, with policymakers and uh, it, uh, up to and including people at the ministerial level. And so at the moment, there's a lot of political momentum uh, the, the, the trick is going to, I think, as you're, as you're only too sensitive uh, or, or to, 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 to aware of, is, is turning that political men momentum then into something which means that people say, yeah, we are going to share our data, we are going to make this openly available, we are going to follow the US model. And that's going to be, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a tough one. But, but uh, you know, I think we stand the best chance we've ever stood a present of, of actually achieving that openness and uh, we I think we've all just got to work hard to make sure it happens. Fernando? Maybe the challenge is, is that perhaps, let me just address your second part <clears throat> and just briefly, there's maybe too many networks and ultimately the challenge is going to be how is it that we make these networks, um, the data and the information that they're generating interoperable and how is it that we're going to harmonize um, these land cover classification systems? I'm not going to endorse a particular one. I'm not going to endorse John Townsend's at, at University of Maryland. Why not? Or, <laughs> or my other friend in, uh, at Rome and FAO of the land, uh, global land cover facility of the, right, uh, LC, it, who's, who's, who's land launched this LCCS, which is, it claims to, that they have, they truly can harmonize classification system um, uh, at multiple scales. So this is a major challenge um, and, uh, you know, it's a dangerous place for you to go out and say that one system actually is going to be the one that solves that question. But uh, we need to move forward on that and ultimately it is, you know, when you finally can bring some agreement as to how this data can really uh, be has buy-in from multiple stakeholders so that then, then we can do better decisions um, is, is, is uh, the way to go, right? I, I'd just like to add one thing. Since, since I'm leaving UNEP, I, I can be put kind of a, a cog in this. I, the, it, the, the, one of the biggest discussions we had in our governing council and side meetings and everything was, and, and even before that, um, was from potential users of the, of the data and information, and particularly developing countries. They, they were, they lacked understanding at all of what this GIOS was all about. I was asked a number of times what was going on and really couldn't explain it very well because it started out as an initiative dominated by the United States, uh, the EU, Japan, and South Africa. And so only slowly have developed, even though there's 60 countries that have signed on to this, there's really a lack of understanding about 
the potential benefits for developing countries, what's really going on, will the users uh, have major inputs in, into deciding how the, these data will be, uh, the, the questions that will be asked and, and how the data will be used. And I, to me, I think that that's the biggest challenge right now. I, I, I just see it in the, in the way questions have been addressed to me over the last four or five months as, as I've been very involved in some of the discussions on UNEP sides with GIOS is there's real uncertainty out there in the part of developing countries about whether they're just getting pulled, kicking and screaming into something that they either don't understand, it's completely driven by the North, or it's not really gonna benefit them. And I think the challenge, and, and I agree with all the comments here, I think that GIOS could be a very, very powerful network in, in the future, but I think there has to be much more sensitivity and education to to what's going on with particularly with developing countries but other NGOs as well and and so I still see that there there's there's a gap there in information and knowledge thank you Steve we had a question down here thank you uh, my name is Larry Hausman I'm working with the Nature Conservancy I want to join the uh, in this chorus of praise for the work that's been done. I, um, I think uh, in, some, in some pieces of the discussion I've found what I think, at least from my perspective, is, a, um, is kind of a key um, element to this business of trying to translate information like this into something that actually happens on the ground and looking at other countries and how the process works. I do think this question of of trying to educate um, uh, decision makers, bringing uh, the point that you made, Jay, about trying to bring the technical world into the policy world in such a way that you actually get change down the road, I think is key. And um, I think from, again, from my perspective, I think the idea of trying to market this in a way which so far that's been almost ignored by a lot of the organizations that are involved uh, don't see marketing as being a, a kind of critical element in this idea of selling what's going on so that people actually may s step back and, and decide something needs to happen. I, <clears throat> along with that, I'm just wondering whether anybody's done any work in terms of looking to projecting this into the future. Has anyone done anything that, say, takes the data that we have right now and looks 10 more years into the into the future or even further to get again the kind of dramatic impact that maybe will make uh, uh, changes in in uh, the way that other countries view this uh, view what's happening to them thank you, th th thank you. Um, is, do we have uh, any any respondents here who would like to take that on? That always bring going into the area of speculation and into the future always makes a, a discussion much more controversial in terms of uh, and presenting data. My experience is that presenting existing data and, and cataloging change that's out there uh, is uh, can be less. Uh, diversionary in, in terms of being open to arguments of, of uh, the validity and that kind of thing. But as a government guy, perhaps I can respond to the first part. I mean, it, most, well, there are a lot of government agencies here, and, and traditionally the federal government has not done a very good job of marketing. I mean, we're just not uh, in, in that business. I think NASA, as government agencies go, is pretty good at, at sort of getting uh, its. Um, stuff out there and generating excitement, and, uh, but even we don't do uh, this kind of uh, presentation or marketing as, as, as well as we could. And, and frankly, I think it's just going to take getting it out of government hands before that really happens. I mean, there, there is interest in, on the part of folks like Google and Microsoft in, in, in making these images much, much more available than they, they ever would be through, through government archives, and we'll see where that goes. Um, but that may be part of the solution. In terms of, of forecasting ahead and, and, and looking um, into the future a bit, I, I meant, they mentioned at the out, John mentioned at the outset when he introduced me, I believe that I, I manage a program called ecological forecasting, and, and, and part of what we do is try to bring observations from satellite imagery together into models, uh, some of them predictive models, to try to understand likely uh, changes over time, both in, in terms of how those will impact biota, but also just what uh, 
uh, changes to land cover likely going to be, and, and folks at institutions like John's uh, University of Maryland and, and elsewhere are certainly doing um, some predictive modeling using, using socioeconomic data and other data to, to look at uh, land cover change out over the next five, ten plus years. So uh, I think the key is, is to establish the baseline, get the data sets together, and then do something with them, do an assessment uh, as, as broadly as one can of change over, 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 the, over the past 30 years, and then use that as your trajectory for looking, looking ahead. Steve, you want a uh, final well, comment I think, here? There's, I think there's a, there's a great example in um, Mexico City where one of our collaborating centers is not doing work for UNEP in this case, but they're doing work for the, the, the municipal government. And they, what they've done is they've tracked, they, you know, they know that there has been sprawl into protected areas and areas that are not, there's not supposed to be development in. And you can actually see it on the hillsides, but what they've done is they've taken the, the images from the past, uh, you know, 20 or 30 years, they've tracked those on an information system and modeled what would happen over the next 10 or 15 years and, and then um, uh, shown this to the decision makers and saying, you know, this is the way it's going. We all see it happening up there, but this actually gives evidence of what's going on, where the change has taken place, and what's going to happen if you don't do something about it. So in terms of local level initiatives, that, that's been one that's actually quite an exciting one. Again, it's not, not something that we've promoted. It just happens to be a partner of ours that's working with the local government to do it. So uh, th there are cases like that where it's worked very well, I think. I think with that, we're out of time. I want to thank all of you for coming and joining us for the, the launch here in Washington of this important publication. I'd like to thank all of the cooperating agencies that uh, have been involved in this, particularly USGS, NASA, and uh, the leadership that, uh, that Fernando has, has provided at the State Department. And uh, certainly, I want to... Uh, thank uh, the University of Maryland for its engagement here, uh, not only in the launch of this atlas, but in the broader uh, effort of uh, DIWA in North America. And finally, I want to thank Steve and Ashbindu and UNEP uh, for this uh, excellent publication, for, for providing information and getting it out, uh, it seems, around the world and not just, uh, not just here nationally. So thank you all for coming, and thanks here to our panel members. Thank you.